Good day. My previous video described what were dramatic events that had taken place in the conflict in Ukraine over the previous 24 hours. To recap, there was a big armoured attack by Ukrainian forces south of Orekhov towards the village of Rabotino, an attack which was repulsed with heavy losses, but which was accompanied by multiple reports in the Western media based on an article in the New York Times that this was the start of the big Ukrainian offensive, that the long process, which had supposedly been previously underway, of softening up Ukrainian, uh, of Russian defences had now um, reached its culmination and that a big mechanised attack with hundreds of thousands of Western trained troops and hundreds of armoured vehicles would now take place. Well, there was that big attack south of Orekhov, which, as I said yesterday, failed disastrously. There was intense fighting on the Vremevka ledge at a, a village, principally at a village called, Stra uh, um, called uh, Staromayorsk. I will discuss that in a little bit more detail shortly. There continues to be fighting in the Bakhmut area. And of course, the Russians also continued their offensive in the north of the border of the front lines, penetrating in Kharkov region, continuing their advance towards the Oskol River and gradually also towards Kupiansk and Liman as well. And, of course, also there was a huge Russian missile attack right across Ukraine with Russian missile strikes on Ukrainian air bases used, one assumes, to launch uh, storm shadow missiles towards Crimea and towards other Russian positions. So, yesterday in my video, I reported period of intense fighting. The last 24 hours have been much quieter. There's been no more big Russian attacks since the Ukrainian attacks rather sin, um, in the southern front lines. Subsequent to that major attack um, south of Orekhov, there's been some discussion there seems to be actually some uncertainty even amongst the Ukrainians about what precisely to do next. There's been fighting, continued fighting, intense fighting in the Bremevka Ledge area and in the Bakhmut area. I'll come back to that shortly. And the Russians continue their incremental advances on the north. But overall, the last 24 hours have been much quieter and it's also been quieter this morning. There was a certain amount of Ukrainian activity, um, it should be said on the southern front lines, but nothing like on the scale of the day before. And at the moment, the situation overall appears to be quiet. So we'll see what Ukraine does, but before proceeding, I'm going to read out briefly to official Russian bulletins. Firstly, the Russian Defense Ministry has now provided updated figures for what happened over the course of the attack in Rabotino. It says that in the Zaporozhye direction, after the Ukra failure of the Ukrainian offensive north of Rabotino, in which up to three battalion tactical groups from the strategic reserve brigades have been involved. Notice that expression, strategic reserve brigades. We're going to come back to it shortly. The enemy, having suffered heavy losses, restored its combat capability overnight and did not take any active actions. As a result of our actions by the operational, tactical and army aviation and artillery, Ukrainian units have been hit close to Belogoroye, Omelnik, Novodanilovka, 
Orechov and Piatihatki. In addition, the actions of one Ukrainian sabotage and reconnaissance group have been disrupted close to Stepanovka. These sabotage and reconnaissance groups are small groups that the Ukrainians send to try to infiltrate Russian positions. The Russians do the same, but we don't hear about it to anything like the same degree when it's done by the Russian side. But anyway, they can number from anything between 10 and 50 or 100 men. So that doesn't really give us much of an idea of exactly how big the losses involving the sabotage and reconnaissance group was. Well, but then the Defence Ministry gives us figures for total losses, both for the big attack um, south of Orechov, which I discussed yesterday, and for further attacks that have taken place on a much smaller scale since then. It says enemy losses were up to 280 Ukrainian servicemen. Now, in my video yesterday, the Russian Defense Ministry said that it was 100. They've clearly increased the figures. It's important to stress that the Defense Ministry speaks of enemy losses. I've seen some people continue to interpret this as claims that 280 Ukrainian troops were killed in the fighting. It's now, I think, conclusively established that what the Russian Defense Ministry means when it gives these totals is that it talks about men who have been killed and wounded, severely wounded, to the point that they can no longer engage in combat operations, but have to be sent back to the rear for urgent treatment. And I think that's a point I want to reiterate again. I still see some people making extrapolations about Ukrainian losses and what that means in terms of Ukrainian manpower based on assumptions that these figures refer to soldiers killed. They do not. They refer to soldiers killed and wounded. Anyway, enemy losses were up to 280 Ukrainian servicemen. 25 tanks, yesterday it was 22, but the number has now increased by three more to 25 tanks, 10 infantry fighting vehicles, three armoured fighting vehicles, so that's gone up from one to three, two motor vehicles, two check, one check manufactured RM-70 multiple launch rocket system and two UK manufactured AFH-70 howitzers. So we see that this Ukrainian column, which attacked south of Orechov, was what some people in the West would like to call a combined arms column. It was very tank heavy, and we see that large numbers of tanks, more than a score of tanks, were apparently knocked out, but included infantry, 10 infantry fighting vehicles were destroyed, three armoured fighting vehicles were destroyed. It's reasonable to assume that these are only a proportion of the total. We're told that 100 armoured vehicles were operating in total, so we can see that um, this is 38 of them. The others presumably were pulled back, but it was clearly a combined arms force. It included both tanks and infantry fighting vehicles and armoured vehicles and large numbers of infantry, and it was supported by artillery, Western supplied artillery, a Czech manufactured RM-70 multiple launch rocket system. By the way, this system has its antecedents during origins during the Cold War. It's created by the Czech military during the Cold War when Czechoslovakia, as it then was, was an ally of the Soviet Union in the Warsaw Pact. And uh, the current Czech military has inherited this apparently rather potent system 
It was participating in this attack south of Orechov. And of course, we've also had two UK manufactured FH-70 howitzers. These are self-propelled guns, 155 millimeter guns. I understand that Britain has supplied pretty much its total stock of these rather modern howitzers. And we can see that this force also included mobile artillery. So it was tank heavy, but included infantry on their mechanized vehicles, and it had artillery support as well. And as I discussed over the course of the program yesterday, it was also in accompanied by an airstrike. There was the Ukrainian Air Force attempted, in fact, carried out an airstrike as well. So if you're talking about combined arms warfare, well, this is clearly an attempt at it. And of course, again, let me re reiterate, these are these figures that the Russians are giving us are figures of, for losses. They are not figures for the total size of the force, which numbered apparently around 100 vehicles. So that gives, you, gives us all some idea of the scale of that attack that the Russians so comprehensively de defeated um, um, a, day and a, a, day, a, a day and a half ago. And Putin himself has actually commented about this. He was interviewed by a journalist from Channel One um, Russia TV. Um, this is on the sidelines of the Russia-Africa summit. And I'm going to read out the entire interview. It's fairly short. And this is the question that he was first put. Mr. President, can I ask you a question about the Ukrainian counteroffensive? Many experts in the West have been saying these past few days that the decisive stage in Ukraine's counteroffensive is about to begin or is even underway already. Whilst everything that happened before that was nothing and that now they are going to show us what is what. Have you witnessed any attempts by Ukraine to step up military action? And is this really the decisive stage? Overall, what is your assessment of the situation on the front line? Can I also ask you to provide details on the casualties on both sides, both for Russia and Ukraine? Can you share the latest data, please? Now, that's an interesting question, and it shows that this is a real interview. Some of the other interviews that have taken place have been clearly staged, but this journalist is asking some rather uh, probing questions. He's asking Putin to confirm, for example, the scale, not just, just of Ukrainian casualties, but also of Russian casualties. And we'll see what Putin has to say about that. Anyway, this is Putin's answer. As we have already said, and as confirmed by the actual action along the line of contact, the so-called counteroffensive, this broad counteroffensive, started on 4th June 2023. This is an obvious fact, demonstrated amongst other things by the fact that the Ukrainian army have engaged their so-called strategic reserves. And again, we go back to what the Ministry of Defence was saying in its bulletin about the fact that Ukraine has now called up its strategic reserves. Putin is saying the same. He says that throughout this offensive, the Ukrainians have been feeding into the battle line the various brigades that were trained for the offensive, the famous nine brigades trained and equipped by the West, the three brigades that Ukraine itself trained and equipped for this offensive. So they've been feeding them in. They've been doing that since the 4th of June. And of course, they did it in a big way in the attack that took place a day and a half ago. And claims that Ukraine is keeping large numbers of troops in reserve, at least 
troops earmarked for this offensive. Putin seems to discount that. And of course, he's very careful to say that it's simply not the case that we're looking at <coughs> the decisive blow being struck now, that everything before was just probing attacks. Clearly, this is an offensive which has been continuously underway since the 4th of June. Anyway, he then goes on to say this. As for the past few days, we can confirm that combat action has entered its intensive phase to a significant extent. The clashes are primarily concentrated in what they call in the West the direction of the main attack, the Zaporozhye sector. Yesterday, there was serious military action within the area of responsibility of the 810th Brigade of the Black Sea's Naval Infantry and the 71st Regiment of the 42nd Division of the Southern Military District's 58th Army. So, these were the Russian forces that were countering this attack. The 58th Army is the major force holding the southern front lines, apparently still commanded uh, by General Popov, but that might be, uh, I mean, that might not be correct, but anyway, it's the 58th Army. There's one regiment that is holding the line near Rabotino. Most of the forces of the 58th Army will be located behind the Surovikin line further south. But there's also Marines from the Black Sea uh, Naval Infantry as well. Though um, a large amount of the forces from the Marines are also deployed in other places like Vugledar, for example. And then Putin goes on to say this, I can tell you without any exaggeration that our soldiers and officers have demonstrated mass heroism on a vast scale. The enemy used armoured machinery in large numbers by sending 50 pieces of military hardware into battle. It was actually, as we know, <coughs> more, or, more than that. Putin is perhaps mistaken here about the numbers. It was more like 100 according to Western and Ukrainian and Russian sources, rather than 50. And then he goes on to say, of them, 39 units of equipment, including 26 tanks. The Defence Ministry says 25 tanks. Putin says 26. He's probably including more another tank, which is probably destroyed. 13 armoured personnel carriers have been destroyed. 13 includes... 10 infantry fighting vehicles, 33 armoured personnel carriers. Putin lumps them together. The personnel of the units, that means the Russian units I mentioned, earlier destroyed 60% of them, whilst our combat pilots, in other words, the helicopter gunships, the Kamov 52 helicopter gunships, and the Mi-28 um, helicopter gunships, destroyed the other 40%. And then he says that today, at my instruction, our troops will be awarded state decorations directly in the area of hostilities. I have already instructed the Defence Ministry to draft proposals for bestowing honorary designations on these units. The enemy has not succeeded in any of the sectors of combat activity. All attempts at the counteroffensive have been stopped. The enemy has been forced to retreat with substantial losses. To get today, they try to recover the damaged assets as well as pick up the wounded and casualties after leaving them on the battlefield yesterday, but were also dispersed. This is the current situation as of this moment. So some of these minor attacks that have taken place over the last... 24 hours, were not really intended to penetrate the Russian lines. Rather, they were intended to ret retrieve some of this machinery, the tanks, the vehicles that were lost over the course of that attack, to take them back to the rear, to send them to Poland to, and Germany and wherever, and to try to get them repaired there. And Putin says that this wasn't successful.
the Russians acted to disperse the troops, Ukraine said, to try to recover all of these, all of these pieces of equipment. And then the journalist, who, as I said, is a real journalist, comes back and dwells on the question of losses. And this is what Putin says. Of course, the military hard, apart from the military hardware, the adversary sustained multiple casualties of over 200 people. Now, we know the Ministry of Defence tells us that the total number is now 280. Unfortunately, we lost people too, but the difference is overwhelming with many times fewer casualties on our side. In fact, our casualties amounted to less than 10% of the enemy's losses. Let me reiterate and emphasize that everything that happened over the past 24 hours demonstrates the mass heroism of our soldiers and officers at its best. And there the interview ends. So, Putin says 200 men killed or wounded on the part of Ukraine. He says that the losses that the Russians incurred over the course of that fighting were less than 10% of that total. So we arrive at a figure of around 20 dead and wounded. That's as close, I think, to information about Russian losses on any particular day as we're likely to get. So, at least from this level, this level of, of source. So, a terrible day for Ukraine. Now, I have to say, over the course of the fighting yesterday, the Western media, having followed the cue of that article in the New York Times, continue to talk about, you know, the Ukrainians making big advances, that the, there was an, also an article in the Daily Telegraph, which stayed up for hours. It was continued to be um, available on its website the following day, talking about a Ukrainian breakthrough and talking about the geolocation of Ukrainian armoured vehicles south of Rabutino, behind the Russian front lines. And there was also Ukrainian maps which purported to show Rabutino captured by Ukraine. Well, Rabutino was never captured by Ukraine. It remains firmly under Russian control. But what is true and it is somewhat of an enigma, something of a mystery, is that one Ukrainian infantry fighting vehicle did trundle on, even as all of the others were being knocked out and destroyed, trundled on past Rabutino, apparently unchallenged by the Russians, and it went on, driving south until eventually it did finally reach the outlying defences of the Surovikin line, the great fortified line. And there's videos where you can see it moving forward and you can see pictures of the dragon's teeth that are part of the Surovikin line um, in the film. And then, bizarrely, this vehicle comes up against the anti-tank bridge, and it falls over, and it falls on its side. There's been much discussion about this, but this rather strange incident, and much commentary as to what it's about, suggestions that it was a Ukrainian, um, that the driver of the Ukrainian vehicle became disorientated and lost his sense of direction, and instead of retreating, he continued to advance and advanced 
without realising quite where he was going and then got lost and then tumbled into this ditch. We've no word about what happened to him or any of the other men in this vehicle. And we've no real explanation of why the Russians allowed this vehicle to move so far past Rabutina all the way to their front lines, even whilst all those tanks and other vehicles were being destroyed north of Rabutino. Now, I'm going to suggest a theory, and it's purely a theory, that this was not a driver losing his way. I think it was more likely a case of desertion. I think that the driver of this vehicle and the troops decided that they were not keen to get involved in a suicide mission. I think they changed course, moved apparently some distance to the west of Rabutino. In other words, they disconnected themselves from the main Ukrainian force and they moved south, intending to surrender to the Russian army. And I suspect that they were in some kind of contact, radio contact, with uh, the Russian troops telling them that they were coming over to surrender. There's been lots of reports that numbers of surrenders by Ukrainian troops have increased, including officers. And this looks to me like a rather clump, well, an attempt by some Ukrainian soldiers to surrender as well. And I suspect that when the Russians saw this vehicle trundling towards them by itself, they realised that that was what was happening and that was why they left it alone. But anyway, regardless, and that's, I accept my own theory, regardless, that was the breakthrough. It is this, in, this solitary vehicle detached from the rest of the armoured force, trundling past Rabutino to the west and the north, reaching all the way down to the Surovikin line, tumbling into an anti-tank ditch, turning over, and as I said, who knows what has happened to the crew. So that was the breakthrough. That was what the Daily Telegraph was reporting. And as I said, we can see that sometimes Western reporting, Western understanding of what is going on on the battlefields is not always especially accurate. Anyway, that was the battle. Now, there are reports today that the Ukrainians are concentrating more infantry in the Orekhov area, that they might be preparing to launch another attack. But having attempted this so-called combined arms attack, which they've been pushed constantly towards attempting by their Western friends, so-called friends, this time it will be, again, another infantry attack of the kind that we've seen so often criticised by Western commentators and Western military officials and by the Bundeswehr and by General Milley, and by people like that. So, once again, they're reverting to that particular pattern. So, no breakthrough on the southern front lines, very heavy Ukrainian losses, and incidentally, Russians have been able to capture some more trophy vehicles. They have captured an AMX 10RC wheeled tank, Apparently intact. I've seen pictures. Um, I'm not sure precisely where this wheeled vehicle was located. It seems to have been abandoned by its crew, understandably, given the fact that it's essentially a death trap on these front lines. Anyway, the Russians have taken it. It's a trophy. They're certainly not going to use it. They're going to be no doubt taking it to Moscow where it will no doubt turn up in a museum before very long. And um, that's the situation. In the southern front lines, we'll see what the Ukrainians try to do again. I would say something else. We heard, saw that Putin was saying that um, south of Orekhov, in this attack, uh, 
at Rabutino, the Ukrainians trying to send some troops to try to retrieve some of these knocked out or perhaps abandoned vehicles that are now littering the landscape and that the Russians dispersed them. There's now some evidence that after these attacks, the Russians also go, the Russians send Lancet drones hovering over the battlefields and that they actually use these drones to destroy whatever is left of these vehicles that have been abandoned by the Ukrainians, thereby eliminating any possibility of the vehicles being taken back to the rear by Ukraine and refurbished and brought back into the battle. And of course, cutting down into the totals of the losses in terms of armored vehicles that Ukraine is suffering from. And that those losses, especially losses in tanks, are now becoming critical is strongly indicated by a further piece of news which has come out from the United States. This is that the United States is accelerating its delivery of a Abrams tanks, the early editions of the Abrams tanks. The first batch, around seven or eight, is going to be sent to Germany it, at the end of August to be refurbished there. They'll then apparently be collected by the Ukrainians and the hope is that they will be with the Ukrainian military sometime in September. That suggests to me, because this is an accelerated time scale, that the United States is becoming alarmed by Ukraine, the scale of Ukrainian tank losses. And with large numbers of Leopard 2s now verifiably knocked out and perhaps knocked out beyond repair and with Germany and the European countries no longer in a position to supply replacements. They can at best only supply Leopard 1 tanks which are hardly equivalent to the Leopard 2s as I've discussed many times, that the United States worried about the fact that Ukraine's tank arsenals are now starting to run critically short, has been obliged to move forward with its Abrams deliveries, though I suspect that September is still going to be too late for Ukraine to use these tanks in this current offensive. So that perhaps is an indicator of how critical things are. Now, the fighting hasn't only been on the southern front lines. There's been intense fighting on the Bremevka ledge. There's universal acceptance by all sides that the Ukrainians have finally managed to battle through and occupy part of the former village, of the village of Staromayorsk on the Vremevka ledge. This was, it's a deserted village now, but it is, it's a rather, it was a largish village of about a thousand people before the war. And there were some reports that the Russian army had abandoned Staromayorsk. They were, to some extent, based upon some rather emotional reports from um, Alexander Khodakovsky, the head of the Donetsk militia's Vostok battalion, very, very tough commander, very experienced commander, heading one of you, uh, the Do Donbass's militia's best battalions. But anyway, it seems that on this, in this instance, um, Khodakovsky's uh, reports were wrong, perhaps uh, over-emotional, that the Russians still occupy part of Staromayorsk and that fighting for this village continues. 
but that the situation for the moment seems to have become fairly static. We're also told that the village has been almost completely leveled, that there's hardly a building now, that there wasn't a single building now left standing, that uh, those buildings that are there, uh, they're basically their upper floors are gone, which provides very little cover. We're also told that the reason the Ukrainians were able to make progress in the attack on Staromayorsk was that because they concentrated a lot of artillery in this particular area, and some of this artillery is long-ranged, and that made it more difficult for the Russians to conduct counter-battery work, and that this put the Russian defenders in a difficult position. But coming back to Khodakovsky, he now said that the Ukrainian troops who have occupied part of the village in Staromayorsk now also find themselves within range of the Russian artillery. And because of the immense amount of damage to the village, they too are now left without cover. And as a result, they now also are suffering losses. Anyway, Russian officials have now come forward and have made various claims about the situation on the Vremevka ledge. The first was uh, um, Evgeny Balitsky, who is the acting Russian-appointed governor of Zaporozhye region. He said that um, the situation in the Vremevka ledge remains tense and and our units remain in control of the Vremevka direction. The enemy is suffering heavy losses, but is attempting to hold ground in the northwestern part of the village of Staromayorsk, which suggests that the Russians are trying to counterattack and push the Ukrainians out. And uh, his colleague, Vladimir Rogov, has said regarding the village of Staromayorsk, in fact, an entire Ukrainian brigade was destroyed there in the fighting for this settlement. Confirmed data, more than 3,000 fighters since the beginning of the Ukrainian offensive exactly on this section. It is a lot. And um, Rogov said that the enemy in this region throws colossal forces into the battle where they get slaughtered and the fierce, high-intensity fighting is currently taking place near Staromayorsk and that our guys are standing there like heroes. So an intense fight and um, Rogov says that Ukraine has suffered the loss of an equivalent of, of a brigade. I don't think he just means in Staromayorsk but in the fighting in the Remevka ledge overall since the start of the offensive on the 4th of June. And on, about that, he might be right. I think I said that a Russian reporter has actually said that over the course of the fighting, since Ukraine launched its offensive on the 4th of June, Ukraine is losing the equivalent of a battalion six to seven hundred men dead and wounded every day so you one can see the scale of the losses and the extent to which ukrainian forces are being whittled down and the extent to which these claims do seem to tally with the overall russian numbers for ukrainian losses since the start of this offensive on the 4th of june which i understand now approximates to 30,000 men dead and wounded since the offensive began on the Ukrainian side. So that, I think, gives us an idea of the sheer violence of this offensive, of the extent of Ukrainian losses, and it does pose again the question of how much longer Ukraine can sustain this I've discussed ammunition and artillery shortages that Ukraine may be suffering from, and we can see 
we can see how that is indeed playing out over the course of the fighting but the human losses also remain extremely high now having talked about all of that let's come back to the topic of artillery and ammunition losses because over the course of the last couple of days there's been a whole series of reports in the media in the west about how ukraine is now going to concentrate its artillery rely more on the artillery to um, carry out to punch through the russian lines the german uh, newspaper tabloid newspaper built zeitung i believe even talked about ukraine creating artillery fists and there were claims yesterday that the reason Ukrainian troops were able to break through towards Staromayorsk and occupy the northwest of the settlement was because they were able to use artillery. They had such a heavy concentration of artillery there. Now, this could be a tactical decision. I wonder whether it's also perhaps a product of the fact that Ukraine's um, total volumes of shells and artillery pieces are now reducing so that Ukraine in effect is has now little choice other than to concentrate what artillery and shells it has in specific directions and it seems to me that it's at least arguable that given the disastrous failure of the attack south of Orekhov, it became even more important for ukraine to reassure its western supporters and to some extent its own population, that it is nonetheless continuing to make progress. And it's perhaps understandable that it hedged by concentrating a big artillery force in the Staromayorsk area, and that this is what happened then. So it could be that this is less a change of tactics and more an event forced on Ukraine by logistical necessity. Concentrating artillery in a few places does give you perhaps local superiority in artillery, as happened in the Staromayorsk area, but it does mean that other parts of your front lines suffer from artillery shortages. And this seems to be the case in the north, where the Russians are continuing their offensive. There were various claims yesterday about the Russians having advanced a further two kilometers in some places. I'm not exactly sure when. As I said, detailed reports of this offensive are very sketchy. But anyway, it's a trade-off that Ukraine may have no option but to make. And lastly, we have the situation in Bakhmut. It seems to me that the Ukrainian attack there, which led to the Ukrainians successfully entering Kleshevka, that seems to have essentially come to a stop. There's some reports, in fact, that the Russians have pushed the Ukrainians out of Kleshevka and that they're launching some kind of a counterattack. I don't want to say more because reports are so sketchy, but clearly there's been no breakthrough in that direction either. Now, less few reports of big Russian missile attacks across Ukraine yesterday. I think both sides are taking a step back and taking stock after the disaster that Ukraine experienced in the attack south of Orekhov, 
And given, as I said, that this was clearly an attempt at a combined arms attack, and one which failed catastrophically, I wonder whether it will be repeated again. Anyway, that's where we are. That's where we are with the fighting. So what else is going on? Well, a lot is going on. Uh, Sergei Shoigu has continued to participate in the um, celebrations of the end of the Korean War in North Korea. North Korea has published lots of pictures of Shoigu. He's clearly been treated by Kim Jong-un as the guest of honour. Um, I've seen some pictures of this exhibition of North Korean weaponry, which includes some very advanced looking drones, including one that looks like, very like an American Global Hawk jet powered drone. I'd be very surprised and impressed if the North Koreans have indeed succeeded in creating a drone like that, but perhaps they have. I, I think it's unwise to underestimate what the North Koreans can do. But of course, one must also keep in mind the possibility that what we're seeing is just a mock-up. But in the meantime, Putin has been participating in the Russia-Africa um, summit meeting in St. Petersburg. He is engaged in a plenary session. He's met various African leaders, like um, President Sisi of Egypt, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia, um, various other African leaders as well. And of course, this summit meeting has attracted some commentary in the West. There's uh, the actually absolutely factually correct point that 17 African leaders attended, as opposed to 42 African leaders that attended the last time Russia staged an Africa-Russia summit, which was in um, 2019. Um, this is cited as proof of Russian isolation. I'm not quite sure why. I mean, even 17 leaders is an impressive turnout, especially when it includes some of the most important African leaders, like the leaders of Egypt, Ethiopia, South Africa. I mean, these are important African states. But the fact that African leaders at this time might be careful about going is not completely surprising, given that there's been apparently relentless pressure on them from the United States and the Western powers not to go to St. Petersburg, with warnings that if they get too close to the Russians in terms of economic cooperation, then they might be denied IMF and World Bank funding in future. At least that's what the Russians are saying. That's not been said in the West, but that's what the Russians are saying. And I've not seen anyone deny it. So there we are. But even if only 17 African leaders have turned up to this summit. Apparently all the African states have sent delegations and there's been a considerable amount of talk and discussion about what's going to happen. And Putin has made, as I said, a plan, uh, an address and he's also meeting with these leaders who have attended on a one-to-one -one basis. And it's interesting to see what he had to say. He again explained in detail the rationale for Russia's pullout from the grain agreement. He again reiterated that Russia is prepared to provide grain for free to needy countries. And he said that the Russians will be providing tens of thousands of tons of grain to uh, certain countries, which he named which are currently experiencing food shortages. Um, obviously, he feels under pressure to provide these explanations, given that there are high food prices in Africa, which is a hot political issue in Africa. But overall, my overall impression 
was that the tone of the meeting was relaxed and cordial. Apparently, Putin did not come under any pressure from any of the African states who attended, which was pretty much all of them, but none of the African leaders, none of the African delegations pressed on him demands that he open immediate negotiations with Ukraine, in contrast to what happened before. He's apparently had requests from Libya, the Libyan, Libya's presidential council, who say that they want Russian help to get foreign troops, Turkish troops, Western troops, to pull out of Libya. But overall, as I said, the tone was friendly. And I have to say, reading Putin's speeches, speech and his comments, reading the comments of some of the African leaders, it seemed to me extraordinarily nostalgic in some ways. It brought me very much back to that heyday of cooperation between Russia and the African states in the 1960s and 1970s. It was as if there was a sort of collective wish, both on the part of the Russians and on the part of the Africans, to return to the relationship between Russia and Africa, the Soviet Union and Africa, which existed at that time. And much of the rhetoric was the same. The Russians, Putin, other Russian officials, talking about colonialism and imperialism in Africa, and about how Africans and Russians were engaged in a joint struggle against imperialism and colonialism together, which is, of course, exactly what the Soviet Union, correctly, in its day, used to say. The Soviet Union did provide a lot of assistance to African um, anti-colonial movements. And a lot of talk about reviving all kinds of things arrangements that had existed between the Soviet Union and Africa in the past. Um, especially heavy emphasis on education. Uh, Putin said that uh, major Russian universities are planning to open branches in Africa. Very recently, the Patrice Lumumba Friendship University that was set up by the Soviet Union in the early 1960s to receive students, to provide students um, with free education and, by the way, grants um, for what were actually very high quality degrees. I've been told as much by some of, their, some of the alumni of that university that I've spoken to. But anyway, um, that particular university, um, it changed its name after the Soviet Union fell, but it's now apparently going to get its old name back. It's once more going to be the Patrice Lumumba Friendship University. Patrice Lumumba was, of course, the heroic first prime minister of the independent Democratic Republic of the Congo, who was assassinated in a sordid murder carried out with the collusion of Belgium and, as is acknowledged even in academic literature, by the CIA. So anyway, there's going to be all of that. There's going to be more Russian economic activity. Putin, of course, talks about food aid. There's an industrial park going to be created in Egypt. Um, El Sisi was talking about a lot about this, so the Russians will be setting up an industrial park in Egypt, which again, I have to say, reminds me of what the Russians were doing in Egypt in the 1960s and early 1970s, during the time of President Nasser, because of course it was the Russians, for example, who built the Aswan Dam, the Soviets, I should say, who built the Aswan Dam, and who played a significant role in trying to build up Egypt's industrial base during that period. So a great deal of this and a lot of friendship 
and Putin again talking about how commitment to try traditional values is a foundational issue which brings Russians and Africans together. Again, it's not difficult to work out what he's talking about and the contrast with what's happening in the West that he's drawing attention to. And a fair amount of talk about economic aid. Putin's saying that Russia is now reorienting its trade towards the global south, which it is to a great extent, of course. And obviously food, but also technology and such things. I think that we need to be realistic about much of this. Russia and Africa are, for the time being, relatively marginal trade partners. Most of Africa's trade, to put it mildly, is not with Russia. It might increase significantly over the next few years, but that's something that we'll just have to see if it happens. Um, it would take an awful lot of work and a very, very big investment on the part of the Russians to bring trade between Russia and Africa up to the levels that it achieved in, say, the 1970s. And I also happen to know that there are some Russians of that period who think that much of that trade did not provide value for the Soviet Union at that time. And I noticed that the Russians, by the way, have um, cancelled a significant amount of African debt, which is something which at one time they were saying they would not do, but they've done it. Soviet Union used to do that regularly, and that has given rise in Russia to some complaints that Russia gives what Russia gives in terms of trade and investment in Africa is more of a free gift than anything else. Having said that, the world has changed, and as Putin went out of his way to say, Africa today is a dynamic region. It's growing fast economically. He says correctly that it's got every, everything that it needs to become a major economic pole, which is entirely true. And it could very well be that we will see Russian and a African trade obtain a kind of momentum which we have not seen in the past. Certainly, Africa is in a much better place economically today for all its many problems to achieve an economic breakthrough than it was in the 1960s and 1970s, when it had just broken free from the colonial grasp. So it's perhaps a relationship that will grow it's clearly a friendly one, and we will see how it develops. It's, I think, more indicative of African feelings that they've been willing, so many African leaders have been willing to go to Russia and to participate in the summit, despite the warnings and the threats that have been pouring out of Washington. More impressive that so many have come as opposed to the Western claim that only 17 came, where, whereas 42 came before. So anyway, that's the Russian-African summit. It is interesting to see Russia again positioning itself as, once more, the leader of the anti-colonial struggle. And of course, one area where the Soviet Union provided African states with a great deal of assistance in the 60s and 70s was in military and security. Um, and of course, the Russians might be doing the same. There was a lot of talk a couple of weeks ago um, in the aftermath of the Prigozhin affair that Prigozhin himself 
his ultimate destination might be Africa and that the Wagner organization might be re-engaging in Africa significantly again. And sure enough, Prigozhin turned up in St. Petersburg where he met with African leaders. That can only have happened with permission from the authorities in Moscow. I've attended meetings of this kind and I know how tight the security can be. So even if Prigozhin is able to travel to St. Petersburg, meeting African leaders and attending the summit is something that would have had to be agreed to by the Russian authorities. And that, of course, in this case, must mean Putin himself. And, of course, we've just had news of a coup in Niger. Niger is an important country in West Central Africa, part of the French system. It was a French colony. The French have long exercised predominant influence in Niger. They have been the dominant power there. The French also consider Niger important because other African states like Mali, Burkina Faso, which were part of their system, have been tilting more towards the Russians recently and they've been concerned about that. But Niger has been one that has up to now been loyal in its relationship to France. And, of course, it is also rich in minerals. It's a major producer of uranium. And much of France and Europe's nuclear industry, I suspect, depends on uranium produced by Niger. And now, of course, there's been a coup. And France has made it very clear that it's very unhappy about this coup. It refuses to recognise this coup. And the coup leaders, who it's clear are the entirety of the military, have made it clear that they are not happy with France. Some of them seem to be inclined to improve relations with the Russians. And there have been protests in Niger's capital by protesters supporting the coup and some of them are waving Russian flags. So we will see what all this means but certainly security assistance the Russians have provided it since with through the Wagner organization and we could see a lot more of it over the next few uh, months perhaps perhaps a Russian presence also in Niger. The Niger military has issued a very strong statement warning France against any sort of military intervention by France in Niger. We might start to see, as I said, the Wagner forces start to arrive in Niger as well. Always, of course, assuming that the coup consolidates and is in the end fully successful. Now, in saying all of this, I'm aware that the president of Niger is elected. A coup against him is a coup by the military. The coup have overthrown an elected president. All of the comments I've made about this coup in Niger should not be taken as, an in, as, as indicating that I approve of this coup. I don't know very much about the internal politics of Niger. I don't know to what extent the elections which brought this president to power were free and fair and freely and fairly contested. I'm not able to comment about these things. I'm simply making a geopolitical point that a pro-Western leader has been overthrown and the, lead, the, leadership, the leadership group that looks like it's preparing to take over seem to be more inclined to make good terms with the Russians. Now, I'm going to finish this video 
by briefly returning to that Moscow Times article that I discussed extensively in my programme yesterday. Since then, I've given more thought to this article, and I'm leaning increasingly to the view that it is a real interview with a real ex-diplomat who really did par is participating in what he calls Tier 1.5 talks in Russia, and, uh, and is generally looking for some sort of way out for the United States from this intractable conflict in Ukraine. One of the things that made me suspicious about this article was precisely the fact that it appeared in Moscow Times. I did wonder why an article like that would appear in Moscow Times. But there is actually an explanation, a possible explanation, which is that, of course, if an interview were to be published in the New York Times or the Washington Post saying that there's a group of ex-diplomats engaging in Tier 1.5 talks with the Russians and that these diplomats, these ex-diplomats, recognise that Ukraine is never going to regain its lost territories and must recognise, come to terms with that fact, and that there will have to be a reopening of the talks with the Russians about the security situation in Europe. I think an article like that appeared in a mainstream newspaper in the United States. There would be absolute uproar. There would be all sorts of angry tweets and denunciations and criticisms and all that sort of thing. And so publishing this article, publishing this interview in the Moscow Times makes it possible to publish it and at the same time keep it below the radar so that people don't notice. And then that brings us back, however, to the other question of why in that case publish this interview at all and I think there is an explanation actually and that is that the American team the people who are engaging in these talks are becoming deeply frustrated by the fact that the Russians are proving to be so uncommunicative and are not picking up on the ideas that the Americans are coming up with they're not interested in the assurances that the United States is giving, that the United States is not looking to weaken Russia. The Russians see what people like Blinken and Austin and indeed Biden himself have been saying, and they've learnt not to take those sort of claims particularly seriously. And they're probably not looking at all favourably about the comments about Central Asia and the relationship with China, and any of that. So I think that the Americans, perhaps not fully understanding that the things that they're saying to Moscow, in Moscow, might not be of the sort that the Russians would be particularly happy to hear, are becoming frustrated, and they have published... They've arranged to have this interview published in Moscow Times to communicate their frustrations to the Russians and to provide further reassurance to the Russians that, these, that this outreach is indeed serious and it is in earnest and that it is eventually intended to lead to more substantive, formal, official Tier 1 negotiations in the future. So I think that is probably the reason for this interview and the reason why it appeared in the Moscow Times. And I've also been thinking hard about this strange set of comments that this ex-diplomat made about the fact that he'd heard from some people in Russia, 
that you know they hadn't agreed with the original decision to start the war and that he even the major roadblock to a peace agreement is Putin himself and this leading to this ex-diplomat again bringing up the issue of possible regime change removing Putin in Moscow and I can't help but wonder whether one of the interlocutors of this group is none other than Yevgeny Prigozhin. I say this because before he attempted his mutiny, Prigozhin did say things that suggested that he thought that the war, starting the war, was a mistake. He made statements to that effect. And, of course, he did attempt what, in my opinion, was not just a mutiny, but an actual coup against Putin. And I wonder whether this group might have been in contact with Prigozhin for a lot longer than we know, whether they were one of the, he was one of the people they contacted even before they started this initiative. Scott Ritter has said that Prigozhin was in touch with Ukrainian intelligence since February, and I wonder whether the Americans, this group of Americans, weren't also working with him and have been working with him or have been in contact with him for some time. Anyway, all speculation. I don't want to spend too much time discussing this, but the more I thought about this article in the Moscow Times, the more I more seriously I tend to give it give it I'm going to finish by making one point I know that some people in the United States do listen to my programs I don't know how senior they are some of them for all I know might be senior but when I say some people in the United States I hope people understand I mean people who are either in the political system or close to it I don't know whether any of them have any contacts with this particular group. But I'm going to say straight away that if they really want to get the United States out of this conflict, as I'm sure they do, then they need to put aside this obsession with China, this constant harping on the issue of China. Way back... When President Biden first formed his administration, I can remember that there was a conflict between those who wanted concessions to the Russians to draw them away from China and those who, on the contrary, wanted an even harder line against the Russians to break the Russians and to force them to change their policy towards China and who were talking about Ukraine as the place where breaking the Russians would take place. The Russians, if they hear all of these kind of comments, will understand that this isn't a genuine outreach, that it is manipulative, that it isn't really about them at all, and that being manipulative, this outreach isn't really one that can be trusted. The Russians instead will be saying to themselves, they're winning the war. They're in a position to dictate terms. They're not interested in ending the war as a result of a negotiation process, process that they don't trust. Whereas for the Americans, the priority now, <laughs> frankly, should not be to try to detach the Russians from the Chinese. I doubt that that is possible. But if that's what some people in the United States want to do, then that is a matter for another day. The priority for the Americans, for the US, for anybody who cares about US interests, or at least, this is not quite the same, because my perspective of US interests is different, but for anybody in the US who is concerned about the overall US position in Europe, and especially Eastern Europe, 
The concern should be to end this conflict in Ukraine before it either escalates out of control, with crazy ideas of Poland marching into Western Ukraine, or ends in a total debacle with the Russians dictating terms in a way which Western officials acknowledge would be for the West and for the United States a geopolitical catastrophe. That is what the US should strive to avoid. All this talk about China is only going to make the Russians uneasy and suspicious and doubtful that this is a real negotiation. So, put all that aside, focus on Ukraine, stop talking about China, stop talking about Central Asia, talk about the security situation in Europe, see whether you can come to some kind of proposals and terms, perhaps about reviving all of those confidence building measures that worked so well in the Cold War, talk also about sanctions and sanctions relief and all that sort of thing. Talk also about NATO and the situation relating to NATO and also accept finally that for the Russians, Ukraine's NATO membership is the single most important issue and not one that the United States can somehow circumvent or escape talking about. So, that's all I wanted to say about all of this. Of course, it could be that all of these words that I've just said will disappear into empty air. And perhaps if they even get to the people that I would like to hear them, well, perhaps they will pay no attention. But I think they should be said, and I have said them. As I said, I'm not sure that I agree with their overall strategy. I think that the United States should seek a rapprochement with China. I think that NATO is more of a problem than an asset for the United States nowadays. I don't expect them to agree with me about that. But in the interests of bringing this war to an end and seeing a negotiating process properly start and seeing all those lives that are being lost, not be lost, I think it's only proper for me to say what I think. Well, that's where I end my programme today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all of our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, Telegram. You can also uh, support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. You can go to our shop, get yourself the amazing things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, please remember to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. That's me for today, more from me soon, and have a very good day.